Hello, welcome to Conversations in the Void. I'm your host, Joshua Von Ammon, and joining me today is Janelle Engelstad. Janelle is the founder and director of MAP, Make Art with Purpose. She's been working across the globe um, orchestrating this project. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Thank you. It's great to be here. So I guess we can start off by talking about really where this got started, mm -hmm. where the roots really sunk in on this project. Yeah. Yeah, actually, I've, been, I've had the um, opportunity to work on project-based work around, as you said, around the globe over the years. And uh, being able to do that, I've met a lot of different artists who work in social practice and produce projects that they may not actually call them social practice, but they do project-based work that often has a, a, a element of the community and as, uh, as audience that is also engaging in the creation of the work. Uh, has a social theme or environmental theme. And so I've been building this network without tr building a formal network. And about two years ago, I decided to formalize it into a network that presented projects on, a, on initially a web platform. Mm -hmm. And the key to the website is, is that every project that's on the website has a link to it that's called participate. And so it's not just a resource to, to look at projects, but there's a way for the web user to actually either participate in the project or mm -hmm. there's a blueprint for them to reproduce that project in their own community. Excellent. So, you know, they can kind of use that as, as a sort of kickoff point. But, you know, what does that necessarily entail? Um, it's kind of art meets um, like a community. Like what would be kind of an example of that kind of work? Um, well, in my own practice, um, I've engaged, I've worked with uh, homeless population, I've worked with at-risk youth, I've used art as a, in Los Angeles as a mediating factor between gangs, so actually developing an art program where gangs came together and they, um, gang, not gangs, but members of, former members of a gang who were really trying to, already taking advantage of this initiative where people were in the community were wanting to come together and make peace. So having them create a map of LA mm -hmm. that was their joint vision of LA, what does it look like from their perspective and how can they come together and map their land and then and then have conversations about it and then do programming about it. So it can, and all of that involves everything from conceiving of an idea to building partnerships with who are the mm -hmm. different community members that make this happen and then funding it and so who are your funding partners mm -hmm. and then all the public relations aspects and so there's all those details. Mm -hmm. And so so you got this started in LA you're saying. No no, no I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm just giving you an example uh, of a project okay, that was. Okay. Okay. Now let's see. It started in San Francisco in 2010. All right. And I, I was on a residency there for nine months, and I worked with a Slovak artist, Otto Huditz, who's a former student. And Otto and I really developed the web platform and contacted artists that we both knew. We contacted artists that were new to us and said, "Hey, do you want to be a part of this project?" Mm -hmm. And, and that's since, how it started. All right, excellent. And since then, you've moved around, like, uh, what other places? I mean, it looked like a slew. Yeah, I've, I've had the opportunity to work throughout Europe. I've worked in, um, you know, in Central Europe quite a bit, in Poland, in Czech Republic, Slovakia, Hungary. I've um, actually um, have a network in Asia because I, uh, I have a side business with my partner. But we actually import tea, and we go to Asia for our tea business. So I, I double up on art business while I'm there. And so I've, awesome. I've built a network in, in different Asian countries. And um, through artist friends, I have a lot of, uh, of colleagues who work in Africa, and their projects are on maps. So we're starting to you know, really feature a lot of things that are going on in Africa. So it's it's utilizing all these different ways to function within the larger global community. Mm -hmm. And this project that you have coming up, uh, this will be the MAP 2013? MAP 2013, it's the first um, exhibition that MAP is producing on a large scale. We produced a small exhibition last summer in, in residence in the Czech Republic. But this, this is actually an um, uh, exhibition that will be in the Dallas-Fort Worth area um, from Denton to Fort Worth, Dallas, and Mesquite. It, there's over 25 partners, and there will be 25 projects from in October and November, everything from a bike share program to science and art projects to projects that explore immigration, social justice, other human rights issues, and panel discussions, just there'll even be projects where the um, community members can come in and actually help co-create the work with the artists. Mm -hmm. So we'll have water sculptures that are actually remediating water. 
where the community can come in, on, on family members can come in on weekend workshops and create those sculptures with the team that's producing them, Green Meme Design. Cool. Yeah. So <clears throat> uh, you're really just um, getting all these different, everything from an institution like the DMA or the Perot Museum mm -hmm. to um, uh, kind of independent DIY galleries mm -hmm. like OFG or mm -hmm. Oliver Francis Gallery. I mean, um, I mean, and you do this by just sort of approaching them, talking yeah. about your project, and yeah, just getting yeah, them on yeah. board. Yeah, you get one. Yeah. And then you build on the other and say, mm -hmm. hey, so-and-so is interested. And it's really, I think, you know, I've always been, one of the things that I've been, I, why I've been successful and I've been able to do the work I do is because I believe in what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. I work hard, I'm committed, and I'm passionate about it. And, and I think that people want to engage with that. You know, that's, that's interesting to people. And, and, they, and I also have a plan and I work hard. And, and it's not just about me. Mm -hmm. I may be the person who lights the match, mm -hmm. but this thing grows from everybody's contributions and, and partnering and collaboration and really investing everybody as a contributor creatively. And even my, the funding partners I look at as partners, not just funders, that they have a mission. They're funding you for some reason. And, and so I make sure that their mission aligns with the mission of the project. Mm -hmm. And then we can move forward in, in a way that get something accomplished that otherwise wouldn't happen. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> well, it's really exciting. I mean, that you can, you have, you know, been able to get everybody to really act in their own kind of unique way under the same banner. Yeah. Um, you know, that's, that's very much of the spirit that we want to encourage. And, you know, that this is happening in Dallas is really exciting. Yeah. I feel like it's the first time to my awareness, something of this magnitude is actually taking place. So, you know, it's inspiring that you've really got that going. Uh, is there... I mean, where do you see this going? Um, how big you mean can map? this get? Yes. So the reason it's called Map 2013, the exhibition, is I envision it happening every three years. Mm -hmm. And I sort of want to break up the biennial, triennial model and not just have it in this one city. But So Map 2016 would be in another city, and hopefully mm -hmm. it, uh, there's I'm, it's already a little bit of development going on in that, and either it might be in Asia Pacific or in Central Europe. And then the, the next three years, it would come back to the States, but go mm -hmm. to a different city, you know. Certainly. Not Dallas. And, and so the idea that everyone's always coming every year, every two years to this one place, and, and this event happens, a Biennale or an art fair, to instead take this thing to other locations. And mm -hmm. then what can happen in that other location, what's certainly happening here in Dallas is the the uh, the ecology and the environment and the culture of that that place shapes what happens there. Mm -hmm. So the conversations and the projects organically sort of come out of of the um, of the place, and that's what's happening here. While there's certainly some international and national artists coming in mm -hmm. in the fall, there's a lot of local artists who are like, "Wow, this is an opportunity for me to explore this issue that relates to my community that I haven't been able to do yet." Mm -hmm. And and that's really key to our mission is providing a platform for that sort of seed to be planted and and, mm -hmm. grow. and just inspiring that kind of yeah yeah, yeah. and um, and like break up that sort of that model of it's you know this is obviously a non-commercial model so mm -hmm. you know it's not work for sale and it's. It's work that has a different kind of mission. And so, you know, how, if you're not already, if you're already moving on this other track, how can you then take it even further and say, okay, what can we do that's different and that um, makes a contribution in a different way? Mm -hmm. And you said, again, that's, that's going to start up in September? October and October. November. It'll be for two months and there'll be... Um, Lots of public, lots of information. We're going to publish a map and the uh, playing on the name map, and mm -hmm. the map will have all the locations on it, and it'll also have times of events and mm -hmm. different things. There'll be things in parks, things in the Trinity, along the Trinity River, at these different museums and community centers. We have all the cultural centers in the city participating. Fort Worth Modern is participating, and all different. You know, UNT will have. Something Eastfield College, mm -hmm. uh, UTD Central Tracks. It's fantastic. Yeah, it's really great, and the spirit of all of the all of the different participants is another thing that's really helping create this. It, the project is only as big and as deep and as um, 
fantastic, if you will, as all these people who are participating, and mm-hmm. that I really appreciate. Well, you know, I'm, it's really inspiring that you're doing this. Um, I really look forward to this project coming up and seeing what it really becomes. Um, uh, that's about we're about running out of yeah, time, and, but and, uh, it was really wonderful to have you on the show. Yeah, thank you. And uh, I'll just say, if people are interested and they want to look it up, you know, you can check out the website. Certainly, it's just uh, makeartwithpurpose.net. Excellent. And it will have a calendar of events up in August, and you can keep an eye out for what's going on. And cool. And we'll have yeah. links posted with all that information. Great. Well, thanks you. Thank you for coming on to the show. <laughs> thank you. All right, y'all all right. stay tuned. Thank you for tuning in. Hasta luego. His books talk to me. His books tell me he was a serious scholar of 17th century poetry, Renaissance and Gothic literature, and that he probably, certainly, most definitely had something to hide. Scraps of pornographic material slip out of the pages and float to the floor like worn out indecent butterflies. There are penises everywhere, huge stiff things and bare chests cleanly shaven, chiseled abs and asses. I'm quickly uncovering a side of this man that he must have thought he had buried so cleverly in the bowels of his carefully organized study. I'm digging up a lifetime of denial. I estimate it'll only take an afternoon. He must have thought he'd live forever. Lifestyle magazines shoved inside thick reference materials. Gay erotica behind books on literary theory of the grotesque. His widow comes in and asks if I'd like a glass of water. I've rehidden the telltale signs of her late husband's double life among stacks of Byron biographies and poetry anthologies. She gazes at them and mumbles something about such an intelligent man. There's a sincere hurt on her face and tears in her eyes, and I say I don't need any water. Thank you. I want to give her a hug or at least a supportive squeeze on the shoulder, but I don't know her, and I think it would come off strange. I watch her turn her back to me with her face in her hands. I catch the word kitchen in the air between sobs and she's gone. I sit at the desk and wonder if I'm doing the right thing. Then I wonder how making this sort of decision has become my responsibility. I pretend to channel the spirit or ghost or whatever of the dead man whose office chair I now occupy, even though I don't believe in an afterlife or God. I just want someone to tell me what to do. There are pictures on his desk, one of his wife, a younger, happier version of the woman I just met. The rest were of two teenage girls, daughters, I presume. Here they are camping. Here they are dressed up. Here they are at a picnic. Did they know? I pick up another book and flip guiltily through the pages. It's the same kind of guilt that arises when you run out of toilet paper in a strange place and you have to poke around in someone else's bathroom for more. Invasive but necessary. No one needs to know. Life must go on. Another clipping surfaces, one from a dirty magazine of some sort, depicting a greasy young man in a thong grabbing the rather large package between his legs. I've run into this sort of thing before, though never this quantity or intensity. This is my job, I think. This is necessary. I never ask how they die. I just collect the books. I box up the intellectual history of deceased persons and take them to the bookstore where I sell them back to college students and artists and get disgruntled professors. What is my job description? It changes. I wish I could just buy and sell used books, if only it were that cut and dry. But right now I'm the protector of loved ones. I'm to uphold the honor of a family I don't know. I'm to question myself, my own beliefs and morals on their behalf and determine the right thing to do when there is everything but a clear answer. I think this is out of respect for the living and for the dead. I'm preserving something his memory in his daughter's eyes, the idea of a husband in the heart of a grieving wife. It will be easier for everyone if I play the priest. I resign myself to keep his confessions locked up. I will box them up and dispose of them in a faraway, indifferent dumpster. It is not long before I stumble upon binders labeled lesson plans, full of love letters. It's almost too much. I tear my eyes from pages full of this man's secret life, his lusts and loves, I am the voyeur. I feel I should not be here, even though the invitation was mutual and professional. This was supposed to be a profitable endeavor for everyone involved, except perhaps the deceased. The check I write today will go to funeral costs. It may even put a little food on the table in this difficult time of transition and sadness. 
With my lap full of adultery and porn, I stared at his computer, surely barricaded by an army of passwords, an email address unhackable. He was careful, but not careful enough, I think, with my hands full of naked men and outdated plans to meet at misplaced motels on the north side of town. In the box they go. The collection of Marquis de Sade looks scholarly enough, but behind it I find a gathering of DVDs that probably would have made his wife faint, though I can't even say I know the woman at all. Am I strong enough to tell her that her marriage was a lie, that her children were accidents, and that she could never be happy again? Or is, it my, or is my strength and my ability to save her from the horror of breaking every pleasant memory she'd ever had like a piece of glass? Perhaps I'm only telling myself I am saving her because I'm a coward. Perhaps I'm just playing an ally to a frigid husband full of secrets, hurtful in his distant ways, and still I fill the box. My conscience is silently screaming, but I can't make out why. It takes hours and a willpower I'm not sure I can maintain until I'm sure I have finished. I feel less like a bookseller and more like an exterminator. I check inside drawers. I check envelopes and notebooks inside the drawers. I confiscate a few things, tucking them away between the books inside the boxes I have accumulated. I play hide and seek with the dead. I may know his inner turmoil better than anyone ever did. I find a stash of cash, stealthily hidden, a few hundred dollars or so. It would be so easy to slide it into a box, but I move it to the top drawer of his desk to pay for my sins, an indulgence for crimes I may or may not be committing, a plea to the universe to dispel any bad karma I've acquired. Even though I believe in none of this, I pretend it makes me feel better. The sun is setting. I realize I have been here much longer than I'd intended. I scour the room one last time, like an obsessive compulsive hotel maid, but instead of pubic hair and dust, I am looking for any remaining evidence of lifelong secrets and unsanctified lust. One more time, I tell myself I'm doing what's best. I write down a dollar sign, followed by a large, perhaps too large, number on a sheet of loose paper. I find her in the kitchen, at the sink, filling a tea kettle. I think, I have done all I can. She turns to me, and I show her the figure I've written down. She nods sadly, and again her eyes fill with tears. I begin to write out the check, and the room is very silent. She asks me, is that for all the books? And I answer her carefully, yes, your husband had a very eclectic collection. He must have been a very smart man. We are silent once more, and I sign the check, and as I hand it to her, she says, so, you are taking everything. Yes, I answer, and I look into her bloodshot eyes and realize we are no longer talking about the books. She says, I could not have done it myself. I nod, it is all I can do because my legs feel weak. I load the boxes into my car. They are full of literature, poetry, and history, but also secrets and struggles I cannot begin to comprehend. She watches me silently with crossed arms. She is no longer crying. I nod again, and she says thank you.